So to begin with, this issue about um, uh, the finance and developing a budget for projects. All of you, I think all of you, have experience of actually managing an EU-funded project, so EU money and a budget that goes with it. Um, and given the fact that you come from eight different countries, I'm going to rely on you in a moment to tell us how you have coped with certain issues in the budget. Okay, remember that when you are helping organisations on our critical path, I put here uh, this thing about co-financing in the middle. And you all have kind of agreed that this is a critical moment for lots of organisations. So when you are helping organisations to think about how they're going to do the budget for their project and how they're going to deal with some of the issues like co-financing, you should be very aware of the general principles involved. And the first thing is that the budget is only an estimate of the maximum expected costs. For a grant, I mean, a lot of people think that if they have a budget and they say the project is 50,000 euros, they will get 50,000 euros. Okay, and I think you all understand that that is not the case. The budget is what you present as being what you expect as the maximum costs for the project. So you're saying to the uh, EU, these are activities, this is what we want to do. Those activities are going to cost 50,000 and we would like you to reimburse us those costs if they are all eligible. And the EU, if they like it, they say yes, we will. Okay? That's the principle behind the budget. Okay? It is a maximum that can be reimbursed to the organisation that, that, that is the grant beneficiary. So that's one very important uh, principle. Uh, however, the, uh, you can't just put in a maximum total, of course. It has to be budgeted against the given budget lines and you have to itemise the budget according to the activities that you've written into your log frame and what's written into the project description. So you can't have any uh, lump sums. Everything has to be clear of what, what you're expecting to spend. Secondly, and related to that, this issue on co-financing. Co-financing is a percentage of that expected total. Co-financing is not parallel financing. It is not financing a particular activity in the project. It is a percentage of the total of the whole. So again, this is often something misunderstood. Often people think, well, oh, what we'll do is that we'll pay for the books to be produced or something like that. They will take a particular activity uh, and decide that that's what's going to be funded and think that by producing funding for a particular activity is the co-financing. In some situations, uh, particularly not with the EU, there is this mechanism of parallel financing where you can have your own money and produce some kind of in-kind contribution. And how you spend that parallel financing doesn't have to be reported to the EU against EU regulations, EU ways of doing things. However, co-financing is absolutely not like that. Co-financing is where your organisation or the organisation putting in the proposal agrees that they are going to fund a percentage of the total budget. But the whole budget has to be accountable uh, following EU procedures. So you have to produce all of the supporting financial documents to justify all the expenditure, 100%. Even if the grant is only for 90% or 80% or 75%. So this is the difference between co-financing and parallel financing. Co-financing is you have to spend all of the money in the budget, 100%, according to the EU uh, regulations. You have to present all of the supporting documents to that. But you will only be reimbursed, the organisation will only be reimbursed what the EU has agreed to pay. So it might be 90% or 80%. And the remainder is, is, is what's being co-financed by the grant beneficiary. So this is a, a, a key principle that you need to make sure that the organisations that you are supporting un, uh, understand. Uh, I've already mentioned this really a little bit, is that um, 
mostly in-kind contributions, that means non-cash, uh, are not accountable as co-financing. They can't be monetized. You can't say, I'm going to give this chair, and this chair has a value of 50 euros, and that's a contribution. Okay? You cannot give in-kind contributions for co-financing. Uh, in some cases, this actually uh, is changing. And there is some processes where in-kind contribution is, is monetized. But I think as far as your uh, countries are concerned and the calls for, for you, it hasn't yet been introduced. There isn't any monetization of these things. Uh, this time there is. So there is. Okay. The personnel, like if it's paid from other projects, can be in-kind contribution. Okay. But then what are the supporting documents you require to show for that? Uh, simply the, the contract for the other project that you are paying uh, this so the salary yeah, the so salary from another project and then the, the person will be working for example 50 percent for the other project and 50 for for the easy funded project and that that counts for impact contribution okay yeah. but then but then the money the way it's monetized is that you actually produce the same financial supporting documents as if it was from the budget so it's saying okay that's good there is another principle which uh, we haven't gone through all the eligibility uh, issues uh, earlier on but one of those issues mm -hmm. there is around uh, what costs are eligible and we should all be aware that the EU can only finance things once so any one action will only be financed through one instrument through one uh, grant I mean, an organization can have a different grant but to do different things so you can't have money paying for a person uh, twice uh, as it were again. The latest morning we will we'll look at Prague uh, the practical uh, guidelines for, for all contract procedures and uh, but when we look at that the, the issue that I was wanted to raise is that although they are guidelines they are not set rules and there's a difference which means that every country every delegation or every contracting authority can slightly interpret those guidelines in different ways so there won't be uniformity and this happens globally uh, from uh, all over the world where EU money is being spent you'll see the differences the differences are even more uh, exaggerated uh, if you look at the decentralized systems and the centralized systems. In the decentralized countries, the contracting authority, which is a, a governmental institution, uh, they often in their early days are, are much <coughs> tougher and much more restrictive than, than the, the commission uh, is in the way they interpret uh, the guidelines. In the financial part of the final report, the EU is looking at that and then we'll decide what is you know, if everything's eligible they will ensure that your organization is reimbursed for the uh, ninety percent or whatever the uh, the funding was for uh, they're not particularly interested in whatever your internal arrangements are with the partner that's between you and the partner of course it's absolutely good practice that you should have those arrangements written down and be very clear what the partner is con contributing and between you and the partner you might well make an arrangement while you're financing this part and we're doing this that's between you and the partner as far as the uh, the EU is concerned they're not that interested in in the arrangements that you make or they were saying to you as the signature on the grant contract we will reimburse to you the 90 percent and that's it because they only have a, uh, a legal arrangement with you as the grant beneficiary so the other things are, as I say, they are internal arrangements, but indeed on the, uh, in the formats there are places where you can show if partners are doing certain things, yes. which is fine, which is good, because that's also uh, showing that you're, you have good management skills. Uh, well, of course, I mean, there are two issues here. One is dealing with the administration, the, the EU bureaucracy, <coughs> and the limitations that they, that they put on you. That is one issue. And then the other issue is the general one about funding of an organization and how you raise money isn't it so uh, you then have to try and put the two things together and manage it and it's, and it's difficult but I think on this issue it's really important that you are able to uh, try to document some of the practices that you use to deal with the issue and through for example Taxo's e-learning you could put up you, know, you could write up I mean you just gave us two examples you could write half a page on how you did it you know, and it's there as a resource so that when you are doing training with others, you can share some uh, experiences with other organizations. But it's all right, in, in, uh, uh, in Turkey, there are, v there are much less uh, funding sources. Uh, there isn't such a big donor community, so it's quite difficult. Then. Okay, my last, I think the last point I wanted to make uh, was this thing about contingency reserve. Uh, 
just to emphasize that if it's uh, written into the call that there can be always put it in but I guess that you would always advise people to do that okay and it is particularly useful in the partnership where there is a uh, obligatory partnership okay well again uh, from country to country there probably will be different ways in which this is interpreted and with uh, contracting authorities in the decentralized countries this is often very problematic I know that in Turkey uh, actually, there is laughing because she knows this much. In, in, uh, uh, in Turkey, the contracting authority there asks for all the documentation as if it's any other direct cost. So organisations have to, to, to show everything. But this is against the principle of, of the direct, of the indirect costs. It's basically there to say that we understand that organisations have some overheads, and you have some things where it's going to be difficult to provide the bits of paper to prove what the costs were. I mean, it's very reasonable. There are going to be some kind of overheads that you cannot. It's going to be very difficult to show. So they're saying, here's a provision of 7%. This is your money. You don't have to uh, provide all the supporting documents. But that is often not stuck to, and very often you are asked to provide things. The, 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 the EC, the EU does expect you to justify it. Not just to take it, it's not just extra money for the pocket. You, know? you have to justify it. But you don't, you're not supposed to be able to provide all of the same documentation that you provide for all the other costs. Because it's seen as unreasonable that sometimes there are costs where you just can't get. Uh, and it gives you a degree of flexibility. And you argue the case and you, you want. And this is exactly how it should work. But you can't expect not to justify it at all. You have to provide some justification for that expenditure, but it doesn't have to be, shouldn't be as detailed as all of the other um, costs. I mean, I think this is the norm, and mostly they, they do treat them or they try to get the same kind of information as if they were direct costs. But uh, increasingly, in, in the member states, uh, this is not the case, and it becomes much more relaxed. Uh, and I think in, in, uh, outside of the European Union, uh, as with the change from centralized to decentralized management of the funds, the principle from the EU is to try to be tough, but as people learn how to manage the funding and to respect the certain procedures, they then stand back a bit and allow a little, a little bit more um, flexibility. And I'm sure in, in, in Croatia, and I know in Turkey, and, and probably in Macedonia, exactly the same is true with the, the contracting authorities the, the, in, in the government institutions that they are really tough to start with but as they get build up their capacity and there's an understanding of the work they will uh, relax a little bit so we're going to move on to kind of we're getting towards the end of the process really because all of that effort to get uh, to get funding to get the grant do you uh, once you are uh, lucky enough to have been awarded uh, a grant all you have to do then is just to implement the project. So it's all very easy after that, isn't it? Um, but but yes, I'm joking. <laughs> uh, but so usually in lots of trainings, all the effort is about how you get the money. And then it's like, oh, you got the money. Stand back. No, I don't that. Um, of course, it's equally difficult to move on and to do the implementation because you have to think about project management in terms of getting the results of the project and how you manage all the resources in that project uh, but at the same time you have to be contract managers because it's a legal arrangement and you have a contract and you have to manage all the conditions related to that that contract uh, and uh, when you are working with other organizations I think you always have to keep repeating the fact that this the, the grant is awarded and given through the process of a contract and it is a legal arrangement